Hello, hello, hello. Welcome. Welcome, guys. Welcome to another episode of the Chrissy Mayer podcast. Uh, you can find us on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud. And if you're listening to us right now on iTunes, go ahead and leave a five star review. I appreciate all the reviews so, so much. Very excited uh, about some stand-up comedy going on this weekend, this Friday. That's tomorrow, boys and girls. I will be uh, in Bethel, Pennsylvania with the Comedians of the Compound. That's Anthony Cumia. That is Aaron Berg, Gino Bisconti, Don Jameson. Maybe a few others will be there. Uh, this is tomorrow at the Pat and Garrett Amphitheater in Bethel, Pennsylvania. Still some tickets available for that show. So if you're in the Pennsylvania avenue avenue area i keep thinking of monopoly if you're in the pennsylvania area check it out we'd love to see you also got a bunch more shows coming up i'm coming back to the jersey shore july 17th i'll be at uncle Vinny's. that's a comedians of the comedy comedians of the compound show so much comedy uh and then july 20th i'll be at jinx that's on point pleasant beach boardwalk then i'm heading to new orleans august 13th and 14th then Vegas, uh, a bunch of big comedians of the compound shows were just announced for Vegas, September 10th and 11th. Uh, it'll be a weekend to never forget. <laughs> that joke's going to get old real quick. And then I'll be back to Dallas at Hyenas uh, uh, September 17th and 18th. So as soon as those tickets become available, I will put them on my website, chrissymayer.com. Check them out. We'd love to see you guys at a show. We love to make you laugh. If you haven't subscribed already to my channel, please subscribe. Um, maybe I'll post some lewds. No, uh, I'll think of an incentive soon enough. Quick shout out to our sponsor, Cushy Dreams. They are my go-to for all things CBD related. I actually have a little bit here. Maybe I'll light some up because I'm feeling a little anxious. It's really helped me with my anxiety for sure. Uh, they specialize in extraordinary CBD rich hemp flower, also known as bud in cans and pre-roll CBD joints. Tastes great, looks, feels, smells just like high quality weed, uh, but you're not going to get high. You can enjoy all the health benefits of CBD without getting high. There's under 0.3% THC in all these products. It's cannabis that ships directly to you. It's legal in all 50 states. Join the men and women who are sick of vapes and gummies and want to smoke their CBD. They take the artisan approach. Every run is in a small batch, 100% hand trimmed, never machine trimmed. They're constantly doing independent lab tests to show compliance and purity, all of which can be posted on their website, uh, cushydreams.com. Cushy with a K. I like these five packs of joints. They're very chic. They open up, I think, unless you're a child. Um, they just click. They're like very chic. Um, and I like that they don't get they don't get crushed. Woo! It smells, but in a good way. That's because they slow cure it for two to four weeks to guarantee maximum freshness and preserve flavor in cannabinoids. And best of all, it's grown here in the USA. Cushy Dreams has CBD flour and pre-rolls in specific indica sativa blends like energy, hustle, relax, create, dream. So whatever you want to do with your day, Cushy Dreams has your back. Go to CushyDreams.com and at the checkout, use promo code CMP. You're going to get 20% uh, off every order and I believe also free shipping. So great, guys. Just, uh, it's good. It's helped me with my anxiety for sure. Okay, y'all. I'm so excited to have this guy on the podcast today. He is uh, one of the co-founders of Minds which I can't wait to learn more about because I've heard about it a lot. And he's also a writer and producer on Timcast IRL, Ian Crossland. What up? What up, Chrissy? Thanks for having me, ma'am. I'm so happy you're here. I I was like, I, I did Tim's show like back in March, but I remember I was like, it's really kind of amazing when you meet somebody in person that you've just been watching for like months and months and months. And I was like, oh, my God, it's Ian. Oh, my God, it's Lydia. It was just like I was a little bit of a fan. I was yeah. a little bit of a fan moment. The the fan culture is very interesting, especially with modern media, as it, how anybody can pick up a webcam now and pretty much become famous almost instantaneously with a viral video and how how you interact with people that are famous in general and how it like twists the perception of who we think people are. 
Is I, it I, like it makes you think that the person is less flawed or more interesting or I don't know, is does it work in one's favor? Well, or? gosh, that's a good a good question. It depends on how you define that. Um, you can you can sell more products with that whole like cult cult worship type thing, but it, it it's definitely I don't know how you feel about it when you meet people that watch your work um online and stuff. You mean stalkers? Yes, <laughs> yes obsessive. I appreciate them all. <laughs> okay, yes, the stalkers. How you feel about the stalkers? <laughs> uh, I kind of I like it because I like to break through it. I you know I I growing up I was a just obsessed with with media and entertainers and actors and I always wanted to be famous and then. Now, when you when you get some form of notoriety and people come up to you and they're young and they're like, hey, hey, you're Ian Crossland. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I just talk to them like normal people. I, I think we owe that. You know, you kind of owe that to like break through that. That illusion. You, you owe the regular conversation, you mean? Like you owe the like, hi, thank you for acknowledging me. Yeah. If there's a God, I don't know. Do you think there's a God if I owe yeah, God? Yeah, I do. That, you know, the, the universe that has given me this opportunity, I feel like I owe it to like, I mean, this whole radio and television thing's only a hundred years old and how we're, our minds are adapting to it. It's freaking fascinating. Yeah, you forget. You swear on the show? Because of course, I Hell mean, yeah. like whatever, you know how YouTube is, but like, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I would say if you need to make a point and swearing is going to enhance well, I'm that I'm fucking point. talking about, dude. Yeah, Thank you. I'm all for it. Yeah. <laughs> so you... Um, you, like me, pursued a, a semi-useless major in college. You graduated from Kent State. And correct me if I'm wrong on any okay. of this. I just did brief Googling. Um, you graduated from Kent State in 2001 with a theater degree. Mm -hmm. You, Which makes sense. Like, yeah, wanting to be famous. Same thing. Like, I was a communications major. Kind oh, of too. equally useless <laughs> yeah. in a sense. I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know what you were thinking. I just remember my mom telling me, like... Chrissy, you know, if you really study hard in college, like maybe you could uh, work at a hotel in New York City someday. <laughs> like that was her biggest, that was her big goal for me. Is that, or, maybe, or maybe I'd be some famous guy's secretary. That was like. Oh, brutal. Yeah, that was okay. her biggest hope for me. <laughs> okay. so She was a great lady, sweet lady. I just think, I don't think my parents were like. Uh, equipped to help counsel me on a, maybe a major or, or like perhaps see where help where to point me, you know, and I'm wondering if you had a similar deal with your parents, as I always ask anybody who majors in the arts or communication or, you know, psychology or something. In the early days, I wanted to help people. That was all I th thought about. And so I said, I, what's the best way to do that? I'll be a doctor. I'll be a neurosurgeon. So that was when I was like in seventh grade, I was like, I'll be a neurosurgeon. And then as years went on, I was like, actually being an actor would be way easier. And I think I could, <laughs> I could help more people. I could get more famous, which, which in my mind at the time equated to helping more people, the more, the more famous I could get, the more people I could help. And, um, so I was like, well, and it's like the easiest job in the world. You just talk and you get paid ridiculous amounts of money, like SAG day rates, like a thousand dollars a day minimum oh, or wow. something. So I decided to pursue it. My parents were like, you can do whatever you want. That was the nice thing is they were like, do whatever you want. You're going to succeed. Whatever you do, you're going to be good at. Wow. Okay. So confidence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, but they also said, they're like, what do you want to do with your life? When I was 14, I said, I want to be an actor. And they were like, uh, if you want to be an actor, you should start acting. So, uh, so I did. So I started in theater. I hope you're still there, Chrissy. You're, you're a video cut out, but I'm going to keep talking. Um, so I did, I, I started acting in theater. And then I, I, when I was gearing and going into college, I decided I got to get, I got to get smart about what I'm going to do with my life. So I got into journalism like you did. I got into, uh, communications and did yeah. like the college, uh, sports. I, I was on like TV two at Kent state. And wait, what did you play? I didn't, I didn't play sports. Oh, you I was were just reporting like the, it. Yeah. At first I was a special reporter. They're like, Hey, this kid's got moxie. So they moved me up to the sports and I didn't know fucking shit about sports. So I was like the guy, the ball got hit and he's running back and he caught it. And That's it was, basically it, sports broadcasting in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The guy I was with was, was great, but it was, it was embarrassing. So I did that for like half a semester. And then I auditioned for Macbeth and got cast and the director was like you should join the theater and become a theater major and i was like uh and there's a girl i really liked so i decided Ooh, to go for it that'll and, do it yeah, yeah theater people i find college theater is like very cultish and very like join us and you can't be doing anything but theater i remember i tried to uh well i did two semesters of improv in college and uh ultimately it was kind of like 
transitioned out of it not by my choice but like the the director was like oh you're you're an athlete like you're not a theater major i had two strikes against me so uh i wasn't in in the group ultimately but we had a they, they, they were really the theater major was really anti cinema. It was very weird. I'd never experienced anything like this kind of weird call. It was very clicky. I hate clicks and I hate. I like to like oh, invite everybody in and and try and get everyone involved. But they were like, no, we don't watch movies. We just we just read plays. So I, I was four years of my life just I didn't see any movies really. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, it was weird. That makes sense. It depends like who's around you too. And like, yeah, if your crush, if you're like big time crush is in it, it's like, oh, yeah, that's enough. So to... hot. Yeah. Where is she now? Has she uh, hit she's you married. Up she since? has a couple of kids. No, she's doing great. She, she lives in Ohio and is just is rocking it. I'm very happy <laughs> when my exes are doing good. I feel like really? I am the exact opposite. I want that. all of my exes to have horrible lives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want them to crash and burn. I like. I don't want them to die or be injured, but mm. I just want them to know that karma is real. Like at the last <laughs> moment, think of your face. <laughs> yeah, after yeah. All this. But you know what? It's never. I was never the person to like end the relationship. Like I was always the uh, the dumb pee. So that's why. And it was always like something horrible had happened. Like I caught them. They knocked up some other some somebody else, or uh, broke up with me over Skype, or like you know, oh, it, it's Skype. Only that's oh, some modern yeah. shit. Mm -hmm. How'd that go down? Well, you don't have to get too uh, private, obviously. Oh yeah, no, I I I dish it all out. This was like <laughs> twenty. Pff, when did Raf break up with me? Twenty. Oh man, I know we. I have such a weird memory, for, like almost autistic memory for dates. Like I know we met February eighth, two thousand eight. We went about like two years. So yeah, it must have been like twenty ten. When we broke up and like he was over the whole weekend. He helped me like hang a photo on the wall. It was like he was over for MLK weekend. He had moved to DC. I met him. He went to school in Columbia. I was like, oh, wind energy. This will be great. And then uh, he moved to DC. And over time, it, it was very obvious who was like, who was visiting who more. I'd be like, I need to get the, a, a dollar tripper bus. Like I need to get the dollar or like the $5 bus ticket. Like if you buy it right away it's cheaper as the bus fills up the prices get more expensive oh. so i would be like yes i'm gonna come visit you and then he did not have the same excitement for coming to visit me because he was in the in the magical world of wind energy but then yeah like broke up with me over skype and then i think he banged somebody in the office you know oh my God. classic it, stuff it was on video no i think um i think i saw an email of his I think he had left his password in my laptop and I may have perused. Not the banging, the breakup. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the breakup was over Skype. On video. Yeah. No, did you didn't record it though? No, I didn't even think to. Awesome. I was uh I was like, not even uh I was so not of that mind at all. Like I was I was I remember early in like my comedy years, I had would have people tell me, Oh, get on a do a video blog. And I just was like I don't know if people want to see my face and hear my voice like that. You know, I just thought I always thought YouTubers were like it was like the height of, uh, I guess, vanity. And yet here I am. <laughs> yeah, welcome. Welcome to the club. Uh, so when you say wind energy, are you talking like wind, fire, earth and water? Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> Do you remember? No, this was uh, wind like, yeah, renewable when renewable energy was hot back in like, you know, 2008. But I, he got hit by a bus. I feel oh, like geez. he learned his lesson. Yeah, he's oh, fine. Okay. He's fine now. He lived. But all right. Well, things are working out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They they fixed um the wind turbines. You know, the big turbines are like they fuck birds up, I hear. And wow. obviously the noise, uh, according to Donald Trump, the noise causes stress, which is related to cancer or something. I don't know if that is, is real or not. I bet. They build and these I... like spherical turbine things now that the birds can't fly into, apparently. Oh, okay. Oh, so it's like one of those fans that has no blades. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm down with that. Um, okay. So when did you transition from, you were an actor, you were in 2009 Scream of the Bikini. Oh my gosh. I just looked at your IMDb. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> you did some acting stuff. And so how did that end up as, as being a, uh, now you're this like writer producer for Tim cast. Like how did you make the jump from acting to I guess, independent journalism. Um, you know, I always had a desire. It, I, I like journalism. Like I was telling you before, I was in college as, for communications and, and, and I like social studies, like watching people interact and figuring out why they do it and looking for problems to society and fixing them. 
the acting thing was just like, how do I get famous? How do I get famous? Then YouTube mm. internet video came along. I started making internet videos and I was still acting in LA at the time, but I was also smoking a lot of pot and talking a lot of shit about like the problems in society, the military industrial complex, all this crazy shit. I watched zeitgeist. I, my mind was just going. And so I think what was happening was I'd go into the auditions and they'd Google my name. They'd search my name and they'd see crazy shit. Ian Crossland losing his mind about the bees, you know, colony collapse disorder. Ian Crossland high as hell. And they'd be like, we can't work with this guy. It's, it's, uh, and I was having trouble. You I Tim did, casted you, yourself. Yeah. I, I Tim casted myself into a hole, man. <laughs> Tim I, I casted. Doing, I was doing commercials. I never got a, a theatrical agent, which also kind of contributed to my misery in that industry. I was just doing commercials like, you know, I'd go into a Wendy's audition. They'd be like, just say you like it and it doesn't matter what's in it. Like, that'd be the line. And I, I'm like, I can't lie. I can't do this anymore, man. Oh, wow. You I couldn't respect... be a shill for Wendy's. Yeah. I couldn't do it. It paid great. I did an Orbit gum commercial uh, that aired on the Super Ooh. Bowl one year that I, I got, I worked one day and I got paid like 20 grand over a uh, year for the one day wow. of work. It was amazing. That's amazing. But, yeah. 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 It was really, really something. Cause then I ended up going on unemployment later and they, they paid me for just that one. Anyway, it's a long story, but I made a lot of unemployment off of that one day of work for years. It was incredible. Um, Pretty sweet. But basically, the drudgery of going to auditions every day and driving. Have you ever lived in LA or done that whole? No, I visited and that was like enough. I was like, I get it. I, I've been shitting on LA for a lifetime, but the yeah. weather's great. I lived in, in Hollywood and I would drive to Santa Monica for an audition. Then I'd drive back to Hollywood for a couple hours. Then I'd drive up to North Hollywood for another audition and drive back to Hollywood in traffic. It took like an hour and a half on the 10. You'd be waiting just to get to, to Santa Monica. It was, it was drudgery basically. Wow. Would you be like reviewing your lines or, or you wouldn't get into it till you were there? Not usually. No. And another thing I did, I didn't really take it very seriously. I, I, I would not go hard on learning my lines before the audition like if you really want to book a role you memorize it implicitly before even if it's a one line or, or 50 lines you memorize it like the back of your hand before you go in and when you go in you're off book you know it so well they that they, they they can't picture anything else so that you, you got the role and i would just go in and kind of like fuck this man i, I last minute <laughs> look at it try and try and short-term memory it yeah, but I that, remember. Yeah, I, I would audition too. And like and now that hearing you say it, you need to know front, you know, you need to know it like forwards and backwards. It's like I never knew anything forwards and backwards. I was like, oh, Charlie Brown's, I, I'm familiar with their salad bar. I got this, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll let my charisma take me there, you know? I'll, my, <laughs> yeah. I'll improv my way through it. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, I'd get booked, but I wasn't crushing it. And um, the YouTube thing was so, what happened was I, I had this like spiritual kind of epiphany where I, I started thinking about like, what would Jesus do if he was alive today? Have what would your he do? hair he, like that. Yeah. yeah he'd grow his hair long. He'd smoke a lot of weed. He, he'd make YouTube videos. He'd make videos and tell people what, what his thoughts, like you can be a better person and he'd try and reach as many people as he could, I would imagine. So I, I started to do that. I read this, this book called the four agreements or part of this book. Everyone talks about that book. It's amazing. It's, uh, Mick, wow. yeah, Miguel Ruiz. He's talking about this ancient Toltec wisdom, these Aztecs or these, uh, Mex it was like ancient culture. They're like the wise sages around that that Aztec uh, time. And um, they've broken down these four simple agreements, which I'm not going to try and say right now because I, I can't think of them off. The one of them is always do your best. Be impeccable with your word is another one. And uh, the the response, I started telling my friends, I was like, how do I got to communicate this with all my friends? I, I realized we can do this. We can we can break through with people we think are afraid of us. People we just meet and, and be honest with them straight up. And, and you get through to their soul and they immediately reciprocate. And it's like your best friends, like these people you just meet. And I, I was using MySpace at the time. MySpace video wasn't didn't really work. So I was putting the videos on YouTube and then linking them to my MySpace blog and then sending those to my friends. And then people started commenting on YouTube. And the interaction and community on YouTube became so much more rewarding than auditioning that I just oh, kind of wow. let go of the entertainment industry. I mean, it was, a, it was like a a psychological breakdown I had realizing for the last 20 years of my life, I was going to be an actor that it, maybe, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm diving into the unknown instead. But imagine people who they go their whole lives, just feeling it's not clicking. It's not, I mean, I can really uh, feel a lot of what you're saying with comedy too. And comedians like there, there were years where it just, everything seems hard. You're not getting a big break and, and you just think, well, there's, this is the deal. You got to drudge through it. You got to suffer. Um, but a lot of people end up just suffering their whole careers and they never think they never do a slight pivot 
into something that could be more satisfying. Like the acting industry is almost like how good you how good can you be being somebody else? Whereas like the YouTube industry is like, how good are you at being yourself? Yeah. How good of a person are you? How good are you at communicating that? Communi it becomes like, how good at communication are you? How good are you at lighting and sound? You know, having a good microphone is 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 everything on YouTube. Obviously, the content is important, but if if you can't hear it clearly, you can't understand the content. Less important than lighting, I found. I mean, audio, a good microphone, man, that is everything. As I check what? my my microphone settings, yeah, uh, <laughs> they're you perfect. You sound yeah. great. You want oh, to and it, also, if I disappear, clear. it's because. <laughs> You're talking about like, you have to have this. I have this finicky cord. So if I completely disappear, just keep talking. I don't know why I've like okay. I'm plugged into my internet, but same for you. If my computer, if I go off, it's my computer restarting. It's happened. Okay. I think it's Alienware Aurora Ooh. nine. And it's like, it sounds like a jet engine when it kicks on it's air, it's air. <laughs> it's an air fan. It's they said, get the water cooler, but I, I didn't want to pour water into my computer. You ever do a water cooling? No, yeah, it is just didn't seem weird apparently it's great but so sometimes it just shuts down i can't tell why i can't tell if it's like overloaded or what it's nice to hear that your computer is working though like mm -hmm. i have this like macbook it doesn't make a peep so you know i never know what it's thinking oh super, super chat this is Who's so that? nice thanks frank happy to see ian important question what producers um does Oh, what pro does he mean producers or products? Oh, maybe products. Does he use for his hair? What is his hair regime? Let me show you. Give me about seven, 12 seconds, and I'm going to okay, show you. Okay, okay. Okay, perfect. This will give me the opportunity to mention again. You can come see me this Friday in Bethel, PA at the Pat Garrett Amphitheater. <laughs> Convenience of the compound. I like how excited he was to show us his hair products. I don't think anyone's asked him this before. Thanks for the okay. question, Frank. Um, wow. I use very little actually. Firstly, I don't really wash my hair hard. Like I don't soap it very, very much, uh, only as needed. And what I'll use is baby shampoo. So I've got this like mango and carrot kids shampoo, extra nourishing, orange blossom. I mean, it's for like infants. And then I've got Aww. this uh, dandruff shampoo for kids. I just go as like this tea tree oil, lavender, and jojoba. I try your hair is very virgin looking like it, it doesn't look like you've dyed it or it's not processed. It's like, and you know what else helps is I, I don't eat a lot of salt. If you, when I've noticed if you eat a lot of salt, your hair gets very dry and ah. will start to turn white. Like it'll lose, start to lose its color. Um, Interesting. I it, yeah. I think it's the magnesium in the green vegetables that gives it a dark, makes it stay dark. Okay, so I, cool. That makes sense. Mm. Yeah. And um, other than that, I uh, when I wash it, I don't hit it with very hot water. I'll do hot, hot water on my skin. But then if I when I go onto my hair, I cool the water down because I hear that super hot water destroys the hair follicles and strips the oil off the hair. Yep. Yeah, it's bad for anybody with any kind of texture or curl or wave. It's better. Mm -hmm. It's best to hit it with like cold water. So I'll, I'll always do it at the end. I'll be like, ah, and then I'll like scooch away from the shower. While yeah, I'm, like, it feels so good, though. It like hot water on your scalp. Cause I think it's the running water. That's the problem. Uh, if you mm. just soak in a hot, in a hot tub and you just sit there still, the oil like kind of hangs on the edge of it and then goes back in. But when it's running, it strips it away. That makes sense. Yeah. And you're like a, you're a big sauna guy, right? Oh my gosh. Yeah. We have one downstairs. I don't think it was <gasps> right, here when I you were remember. here. Was it? Uh, I was here. Yes. Yeah, uh, March, late March. They, and yeah, somebody did show me the sauna. I don't, I think it was new. It is so great. Are you I'm so sauna? jealous. It's great. I yeah, I used to go a lot. Well, I would go to Bikram Yoga religiously, and part of it was because I loved the heat. It it like uh, I never felt so relaxed and chill than I did after a, a Bikram Yoga class. I just is, like love sweating. Is Bikram like um, regular yoga but hot? Pretty much, and he's a he's a sexual molester. I mean, yeah, that's a big. <laughs> I don't know if that's what makes the yoga extra good. He did, you know, people were talking about, I almost became a Bikram instructor like back in 2006. I was like one bad temp job away from becoming a, a yoga teacher, I think, <laughs> as, as so many of us are. And uh, even back then, people were talking about like, yeah, he's a big freaking creep, but, you know, I love this yoga. So, yeah, it's in like a hundred... 100 plus degree room. I think it can go, can go up to like 115. Mm. And it's 90 minutes um i forget how many i think 26 postures and there's breathing to it 
It's really cool. It's like it was like I was in the best shape when I was doing that. A oh, that's times awesome. A week. What'd yeah. you do? Graduate college and then start temping? Uh, yeah. Well, see, it's so interesting. Like I graduated college. I was like determined to get back into improv because I had been sort of like booted out of the college improv scene. So I did improv at like UCB and Magnet Theater in the city for like five years, did a one woman show and then started doing stand up. Like I wanted to be a reporter in college and then I interned at Dateline and I was like, oh, this is hella boring. And I don't want to move out to like Alaska or uh, like some terrible state and then eventually have to move back. So yeah, after I interned at Conan, I was like, oh, comedy, like these are my people. Mm. So, and the writers were like, oh, if you like comedy, you should do improv. But I'm glad I switched to stand up because it's like just impossible to make any kind of a living doing improv unless you're TJ and Dave, the guys who do the Sonic commercials. Oh, no, I don't know them. What do they do? They they're professional improvisers, but they also I think they made a pretty decent amount from doing the uh, the Sonic commercials. They're the two guys in the car, like one's kind of blonde, one's kind of dark. I don't know. They, I'm sure they've gotten a ton of other commercial work too, but they're pretty masterful to watch do improv. Like they could, they could improvise a whole play that's like as good as anything you could see on Broadway. Oh, it was like fluidity, pretty mind blowing to watch them work. Um, so yeah, uh, did you? When did this feeling of like I really want to get famous like burn inside you? Did, was it like because with some people like for me, I felt like growing up I couldn't speak my mind or be honest with my family. So that's why stand up was really attractive to me. I was like, Oh, I can just be so honest and there's no consequences. You know, I can talk to these strangers. I think I, when I was really young, like a, like a tiny kid, I would watch my parents watch TV and see how much they loved the actors and real. I wanted to be loved like that. You wanted like all that attention on you. Yeah. yeah I was like, why? I mean, it is, they are great. And I would, I would watch the TV and also think, Oh, they're that's awesome. And I can do that. That's easy. Like I hmm. uh, learn a skill, hold a, hold a, a, a razor and like cut through ventricles and stitch together. Like I could kill somebody on accident. That's terrifyingly that difficult. All, yeah. Even like carrying bricks around. I mean, I don't know if you've ever done a lot of manual labor, but man, it's I've done some. Yeah. Yeah. Like chopping wood. It's tiring as fuck. You rip your skin up. You got all these scars and calluses and it was just, so I, I, I was drawn to it from from a really young age and i think it was like i don't know age 10 11 because i was in sport my my parents would be like we're gonna put you in a little bit of everything and then you can find out what you like and i was like well i don't like baseball they're like okay well you're gonna play baseball <laughs> and i don't like sports they're like okay well, we'll put you in all these sports and i was so bad and i didn't train that all the other kids started to resent me and then stopped hanging out with me and oh. i was kind of ostracized from that that group and i really wanted to impress them I really wanted people to like me. So I was like, well, what can I, I can make them laugh. That's, that's, that's an easy way to, to get people to like you. So I kind of probably about sixth grade is when I became borderline obsessed with becoming famous. Wow. Were you an only child? No, I have two younger brothers. Oh, okay. Um, what do they think of everything you've been up to and like all of your, I guess, new, new fame and success? They seem to love it. Max, who's my, he's younger by two years. He's uh, an actor and a director. He's kind of looks across between Jack Nicholson and I don't know, Jean-Claude Van Damme. He's just an <laughs> interesting looking dude. And he's, uh, he's really smart. Hey, so he loves it. But uh, Michael, also very chilly, loves it. He's also a gamer. Um, to be honest, I haven't asked, really. I talked with Max a little while ago and he was like, hey, are you uh, famous? Uh. And I was like, I... I, I I guess technically a little bit more than I used to be, but it seems like it. I mean, when you're, are the videos are getting like eight hundred thousand views a day or a million views a day or something. So, uh, on some level, people know who I am. Whereas like a year ago today, it wasn't at all. Like it, it all of a sudden happened. Was Tim Cast your first um, like show like that, or like where did he find you? Um, I through bill so i was doing youtube videos i've got like 1200 youtube videos under the ian crossland channel and under the cross mac channel so that was kind of my dive into that but to do i hadn't done like a sit around and hang out and talk show ever before this is my first of those for sure and i met tim through bill who founded minds bill and i've been working since 2011 and oh we went yeah down, yeah yeah we went down and met minds. up with tim in uh, new york city one day me and tim started talking about simulation theory and now we're probably in a fucking MMO. And then we were like, oh, let's do a TV show about it. That's that's awesome. <laughs> what makes you think we're in a simulation? 
I don't necessarily think we are, but it's possible. Anything is possible. It is possible. And for sure, what it seems like is happening is our sense, our body is taking in stimuli like light and sound and heat and all this, like vi these vibrations. And then it's calculating them as what we know as senses. So in, in a way it's simulating vibration, like reality as we perceive it is simulated vibration, but I don't think that we're necessarily constructs in a machine that think that we're alive. I think it's more likely that we're actually alive and we're building simulations. I the whole like I maybe you've heard Elon Musk's idea that if we're we're building towards it. So if this continues, we'll eventually get to a place where we build a simulation that is so good that the creatures in the simulation won't know they're in the simulation. So it is likely that it has already happened. I kind of agree with that up to the point where just because it it might happen that it that it's probable that it already has. I just, I feel like we, we're like prime. This is like reality prime. And we're, we're creating that kind of stuff as we go. Almost like, uh, I'm imagining like there's a camera behind my head right now, like following me, like watching me, like broadcast this. It's weird. It's interesting to think about that. Anything that takes you kind of like outside of yourself, I think is worth oh, batting yeah. around. Do yeah. you take psychedelics? I haven't in in a few years, but I've done mushrooms like a handful of times. Uh, had them on my pizza in case the YouTubers are listening. <laughs> that must have been delicious. I love it mushrooms. It was delicious. I, I, I ate the pizza and then I felt like, wow, the subway is so huge. And I just like my memories were that like I looked more fondly on myself. I was just like kinder to myself and uh, more appreciative of like of everything. I was like, wow, like. I'm it was like a different person like telling me that I'm great like wow I'm so lucky to be like born into this consciousness into this form at this time and I felt like I I felt like love for myself that I it's don't so normally great. feel yeah I think if you don't want to get dosed and you get dosed it's the most terrifying horror but if you want to kind of shave aside or shatter the the your your obsessiveness about who and what you think you are then that's it really helps you do that. You know what else does? Watching yourself on video. I don't know if you've had this experience, but it's Ooh. like, it's psychoactive, man. It's weird. To, to say like, you're good and you're healing. And then to watch myself tell, tell me that is like, a, it's like, it's like a psychedelic dream. This technology. Really? Okay. Is like, yeah. It is interesting. I, I have a hard time. Like when I'm watching back stand up, I'm just like, uh, like I could have said this more sharply. Like I, I always see the words that are unnecessary or, um, not so much with like interviews or podcasting. Cause I'm, it's like, it's, I don't know. It feels like easier to me. Like I'm not trying to actively make you laugh. Like when I am on stage, you know, so I'm more critical of myself, but yeah, it's, it's wild. It's, it's, it's wild to think about everything. And I, and I think we are, you do create your life. Like I, I believe very much in like manifesting and your attitude and law of attraction. And, you know, you find the people that are like obsessed with drama and they talk about how they hate drama. Like they always have the most drama in their lives and uh, people that are like relaxed and chill and you just only accept positivity. And even just with a simple thing, like YouTube comments or or like Twitter comments being like, I'm only going to react to what's coming at me with love. Like I'm only going to react to love. And then it's like, all right, you know, like you see a negative comment, you don't have to like wrestle over, like I got to prove them wrong. I got to explain myself. You're like, oh no, on to the next thing. Like I've just created a, like a nice filter for myself. Do you know what I yeah, mean? You're, it's yeah. like, um, it's like altering feedback loops. I noticed that early on in YouTube in like 2006 and seven, I was, I, I would respond, like people would leave a negative comment and I would respond and be like, want to change their mind. But what, what would happen is the people were like, they just wanted me to respond. They didn't care why. So they would be like, oh, he's responding to that kind of comment. So then they would leave more of those. So I stopped. Uh, now I just, I have yeah. like a neutrality to it. I don't take the positive personal. I don't take the negative personal. I just kind of because even positivity scientifically draws negative energy to it to balance itself out. So too much of too much of either is like I, I love neutral energy, the neutron. Um, I love it. You love neutrons. How did yeah, mine obsessed come? with neutral? <laughs> <laughs> How did mines come to be? Like I've heard of it for months and months. I just don't know what it is. It's a social network. It's basically a technology company. And the social network, minds.com, is like the flagship product that um, Bill 
kind of had the idea, I guess, 2010, 2009, about building like a, a free software social network. Uh, like an, It's like open source. Are you familiar with free software? Mm -hmm. The delineation between open source and free? Um, you mean like getting songs for free off Napster? That was the that's last. It, <laughs> that's the problem with this. The way they're marketing it is it sounds like that, but that's not it. You can actually sell free software for money. Is that what free the code is all about? Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. And yes, it is. Here's the cup. You can get it at iancrossing.net. If you'd like a free the code uh, mug. Um, it's basically a software license type like MIT or... Um, GPL general public license where it says that if you you can use the code just like it's open source software but if you make any changes to that code your changes have to also remain public for everyone to see Ooh. So, whereas with open source code you could take it and change it and make it private and pr and then sell it like proprietary which a lot of companies do uh free software remains free forever so forevermore, any iteration of the software will remain free for everybody. And the idea was Bill wanted to build a, um, a social network that could anyone could use and spin up forever. And so that's what Minds was. I didn't understand it in the beginning. I wow. was kind of like, why, why would you want another social network? We already have Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. But as I learned more about free software, I started to get really jazzed about it. Is it kind of like a recipe? And if you want to change the recipe, it's like people can still look at the original recipe but then they also see your edited version so they don't look at your edited version of banana bread and it's like well maybe they would have liked the previous version better is that a stupid example no it's a great example that's a exactly what it is okay it's awesome i don't know if, i don't know a lot about it about the the licensing stuff I'm, i don't get into the lawyering much about it but i think that they actually they see the original recipe they see the your recipe and they get to see all the little changes to the recipe so they don't have to guess like how did you but I mean, obviously, you'd see that when you saw both recipes. So I don't yeah. know how, um, how granular it gets. Why don't more companies do that? Like, why isn't everything open? The fear is that if I make a free software product, that you're going to take the code and make it and make it faster than me because you have more money and then sell it before I can get mine to market. Uh. And that has happened in the past. So it's it, it's that's the, the problem. And it's like a leap of faith. Like, it, it, it's really not about the money. Mines has never been about about selling mines. It's about facilitating a fucking awesome product for humanity so that we can survive and not get censored and have a central authority of who can say, you know, who controls the narrative. Oh, yeah. And format like wise, what would you compare it to? Well, what, what do you mean exactly format wise? Mine's like what is if I were oh, to log on, like, is it like similar to Parler? Is it sim OK? Yeah, very similar. We we um kind of Bill wanted to do it like like you like uh, Snapchat in the beginning, like a basically a video phone app. And I was like, oh, we should do it more like Facebook, which maybe was a mistake. I still can't tell, but I wanted to get the best things from YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. So it's kind of an amalgamation. You have a lot of hashtags, it's hashtag heavy. You can choose what hashtags you want to be in your search, in your results and what you're interested in. But then the, 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 the layout is kind of like Facebook. Um, the video hosting is similar. See, the thing is now they're all kind of becoming similar. I just did a video on mm. Twitter earlier today. Like Facebook didn't use that video that I knew of. Now, yeah, they're all copying from each other because they all, yeah, they go, oh, okay, well, we don't want to lose people because they have that function. So let's yeah. then, stories. Exactly, they're all starting to look similar, just mm. like with with uh, what Victoria's Secret is going through right now. They're like diversifying their models because that to make them more woke. They're adding on like. Megan Rapinoe to be like a like a face for it. She's not even going to be wearing like the underwear. It's like her and um, I think Priyanka Chopra Jonas or something like they're not like we're not going to get to see them naked or in their underwear. They're just going to be like the woke faces for it. And they're like the models are going to be more inclusive, different weights now. And they're doing away with like the Victoria's Secret Angels, like the big ornate, like the freaking wings and the shows. And I'm like all these underwear lingerie companies are starting to look exactly like one another like what if i like seeing a bunch of like gorgeous blonde brunette like and and the models were already diverse to begin with they were from brazil argentina like lots of different countries they just were like all hot and like in good shape and now they're like let's mix it up and have some like big fat women in there too but i just i'm noticing as a chick like a lot of these lingerie companies are starting to look the same that's weird that's weird. Homogeneity, like enforced homogeneity for is very weird. It, 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 it's interesting. That's so weird that like different companies are doing 
they're trying to get everything and make everybody happy, but and they're, then looking they're just they're fading the into same. the crowd. That's so that's so interesting. Because I like I mean Victoria's Secret. It's like I remember being a kid or like uh like growing into be like a woman, and I was like, oh man, like. I would see women that are like way better looking than me. That's what makes me want to buy that lingerie. Like I, I kind of have to see myself like represented in there. I'm not saying like, oh, everyone needs to be all white, but like maybe I liked that. Maybe, maybe making it more like diverse uh, alienates some people because they're like, well, I like the old school branding. And it's like, does that make me a terrible person? Does that make me like not woke? I don't know. I think, I guess the market will decide. And uh, I was talking about this, I think yesterday or the other day, I guess the market will decide like if they tank, um, then maybe they'll shake it up and go back to how it was. But I don't know. I kind of liked, I kind of liked the way they had it. The women were so glamorous. Like I liked that they were all in good shape. That They were all tall. They're all like between five, nine and six, two. So I don't know. <laughs> The more I talk about this, the more I, people are like, she's a white supremacist. But it's like, I no, was, I just like the model. Oh, no, it's terrible. This whole racist uh, thing is terrible. I, I I, I was just watching Blazing Saddles earlier. Have you ever seen that movie? Everybody saw <laughs> it. I haven't seen watch. it, but this is like the third time it's, somebody's like, you have to see this movie. It's so racist. I mean, they dropped the N-bomb so many times. The whole movie, that's what it's about. It's about this black dude that comes to t this this town in the West, in the Old West, and he's the sh he's their new sheriff and they're all super racist and then gene wilder's in it it's hilarious it's amazing mel brooks one of his best um but this whole like forced homogeneity thing or forced like diversity is rate it seems racist i don't care what i mean i guess i i don't really care i i don't know man i don't know if it i'm a product of, of my time yeah it seems like you lose your individual branding as a company and everyone's meeting in middle, everyone's this new uber diverse, not hurting anyone's feelings, letting more fatties in, like everyone's becoming more of the same thing. Instead of like Victoria's Secret has had their very own distinctive, whether they were like black, white, brown, whatever, the models had a very distinctive, like glamorous, tall, like thin look about them. They were still like curvy, obviously like you need boobs, but um, I don't know. Yeah. I think you lose something in your brand identity in your attempt and it depends who's in charge. Right. But in your attempt to be like inclusive, you become le like if everybody was trying to be the cheesecake factory and have every type of food rather than just specializing in pizza or specializing in Italian or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or like, like if a baseball player wanted to play every position. Yes, they probably yeah. would not end up being very good at any of them. I mean, maybe you might get the the occasional, you know, superhero or like you know, this monster that can play every everything and chooses one. But you still they specialize in one or a couple positions, and I feel like companies also benefit from specialization. Um, of course, yeah. Brand marketing. I mean, if you try and appeal to everyone, you're going to miss your target market. I don't know, but I think I think you can still appeal to everyone with a bunch of white dudes or a bunch of black women or a bunch of kids or a bunch of like, yeah, I don't know. I'm not a marketing major. I'm not. I'm not. Just, uh, just, yeah, maybe it's me. my missing the nostalgia because what what that what Victoria's Secret brand was when I was like 15, 16 years old. It's like, yeah, maybe because something is has nostalgia makes it more important or makes it more valuable. Yeah, I keep reminding myself of that, like my obsession with like oh it used to be so good i never want to become that dude it was like when i was a kid <laughs> the things the were better the 90s were better they were pretty badass yeah I mean, the music was incredible that wasn't an accident there was a lot of drugs eddie vetter was like i want to thank was it heroin or lsd for getting me here <laughs> he said it on stage one day i was like what i didn't know he did drugs oh they all did drugs all this music yeah all this culture all the beatles the jefferson airplane they're the doors they were all like heavily into drugs uh led zeppelin dude freaking on lsd like during shows it was an incredible, incredible they must have had the best time like the, i think they were probably less tightly wound i imagine they're probably i don't know i've never been like big into drugs because i just feel like there's so much of my life that i have to be in control of like 
like I need to make a living so <laughs> so I can pay for stuff. I can't just like be on drugs and possibly like lose work. Right. So. Overdosing, especially on psychedelics, is, is terrible. I think I've heard that the reason the hippies failed basically to really enact social change was because they were they overdosed. Like oh. people thought they were teapots because that was they were taking too much LSD. People they just couldn't get organized and formulate plans because they were all stoned all the time. Or like wow. too too yeah. stoned too much. It's easy to overdose on marijuana. That sounds like the next Fast and Furious movie. Like too stoned, too relaxed. Yes. <laughs> too high. That's great. Um, <laughs> yeah, you mentioned the fandom before and like dealing with, yeah, like making sure the positive comments don't inflate your ego too much so that the negative comments don't take you down too low. Um, but, you know, there. how do you feel when people like, I mean, compare you to Krigler or they, if it seems like people like to mention the both of you, I don't know, because people, sometimes people can't tell you guys apart. I don't know if that's fair, <laughs> but um, like, how, how does that kind of stuff make you feel? I, I don't, the first thing I try to do is I don't take it personally. Like I'll get these like lightning strikes of emotion. Sometimes when I read comments, I'm like, dude, no, 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 no. This is a social, this is a study in sociology. The the crowd, the humans are are behaving away because something is away. It's it, I just happen to be a vessel in this process. This Ian Cross and meat body. So I I am God. I am something that's inhabiting this body. It seems like, but this body mm. is like is there. It is funny that Adam was on the show and now I'm on the show and like now Luke's on. Like so, I get that and I get that. Like when you only see the front, like you when you only watch the TV show, then you like when bewitched they had darren and then the guy quit and then they had a new darren and everyone was like fuck him the old darren's better and they're like no the new baron's darren's better and it was mm -hmm. this big thing about like which darren was better um but i don't i just i enjoy watching the psychology of of like of what of what's happening i mean in a way i let it i let it affect my behavior because like if they're like he, you keep talking you keep saying these things i'll see comments like a repeating comment like stop talking so much stop talking so much and i realize okay maybe i need to listen more Hmm. And but, then there are some episodes where you barely say anything. It's incredible. I love it. I think there have been some episodes where I said, like, I, I introduced myself and then I just listened for two hours. <laughs> really? It's really rewarding. I would. I think I would hate that as a comedian. I'd be like, oh, shit. The whole time I'd be like, I couldn't jump in with anything like, oh, I, I came to learn that making your friends look better is is the best thing you can do, especially as an actor, when you're you want to make your scene partner look as good as yeah. possible. That's definitely an actor slash improv thing too. Is like making people around you look good. Mm -hmm. So I'll listen, and man, I just listen. I just take it in, and it's. And then when you do, if you listen a lot, when you do speak, people really listen to you. They're like, "Oh shit!" Ian, so you'll yeah. see them in the chat, like, "Oh, Ian's there." <laughs> yeah, he wouldn't. He wouldn't be He's speaking. He's alive. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's jazz. Like, I don't know why, but I don't know if it's like a, it's probably some subatomic inner reaction that if you listen to someone a lot, that then all of a sudden they respect you more. I don't know if, I think that that's a real like phenomenon. I can't, it seems like it. I think cause so often like we're in conversations and, uh, the person's just waiting for your mouth to stop moving so they can say what they've been thinking about saying for the last, you know, 40 seconds, which a lot of us do. And I think for me doing this podcast has like taught me to, it's been a good exercise in not doing that and like being present. And like, if you're listening for somebody for what they have emotions about or what feels important, it's like, oh, it's easy to drop whatever I was going to ask you. Um, but yeah, so many people just, yeah, they're not really listening because maybe you feel like you got to defend yourself or you got to be right. So you got to have your thing ready so that you, I guess you're trying to protect yourself from being vulnerable or wrong. Yeah. And it's okay to be vulnerable and wrong. I, and it's an actually empowering if you can admit it, accept it. And then not only will you change and, and be better usually as a result, but people see you doing that and have a lot of respect for the humility and the, you know, the desire to change and the acknowledgement of your imperfection. Also, like I'll notice if I'm, if I have something I want to say while you're talking and I'm thinking like, okay, I'm waiting, I'm watching your mouth move. It's so good. <laughs> watching Everyone does go, it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then you're done and I say it and it's like not even on topic anymore. But if I'm actually listening to you, I'll have like three or four awesome thoughts while you're talking. And then by the time you get done, I respond to the last thing you said. And those four thoughts are gone. But I think that it's like, it always, maybe they won't come back in that form, but often I think in reality, that kind of stuff comes back. It cycles through again and there'll be another time or a place, you know, to, to 
it's, represent those thoughts. It's wild. It's almost like, yeah, the, the example of, of baseball, which you hate, <laughs> like, like you see balls coming down the plate. You could totally hit them, but you'd have to kind of maybe interrupt to hit the ball. Maybe you knock it out of the park. Maybe you look really funny or smart, but it takes like, is the interruption worth me hitting this ball? And I, I, comics miss that all the time. Like there's uh, so much ego in comedy. Yeah. Cause if you're not, especially, yeah, if you're not the batter, yeah, if you're if you're not the one that's up to bat, but you really want to hit that ball, the batter is going to be pissed if you run up there and swing when they're like, "Dude, get the fuck, get, step out! You're on deck. Wait, wait until I'm done." Maybe that's a maybe that's the metaphor. <laughs> yeah, you're like, no, I just want to hit that ball. That's a ball I can hit. Like, but yo, I definitely it, like any comedians like, oh, that you you struggle with that. Like, is what I'm going to say be going to be funny? Is it even going to be relevant by the time it's uh there's a pause or a lull? Like when you improv, do you get an idea as the the screen part or the your scene partner is talking and then you save it and then at the end you launch it or do you just kind of have fully listening and then at the end just whatever comes out? Some some imp improvisers do work like that. I think like to the degree to which you are witty and making connections, maybe you're making puns, maybe it depends what it is. If like if you're creating a scene and a world with the other person is different from like just bantering and jokes. Like when you see comedians on podcasts, like old school, like Anthony Kumi or Jim Norton or like Rich Voss, um, their minds work so fast. Uh, and, and and then there's, that's different from when you're on stage and you're improvising with a crowd and you're doing crowd work. And it's just, it's literally like what you see in front of you and the uh, observations you're making, you're making can be funnier than your rehearsed memorized material from, from years, like this word bank of material. And sometimes when you feel like the audience is feeling stale or like low energy, you're like, all right, fuck all that. Like, let me take a risk and ask this guy about his accounting job. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what it feels like on Tim cast IRL too. That's very similar. I've noticed mm, that when I, when cool. I, yeah, when I try and launch those old ideas, people are like, dude, shut up. But if it's, oh, just, if I, I just hate like, when people say that they're like, shut up, Ian. I'm like, I feel like you get, <laughs> you get more of that. Like but, they're extra hard on you, but they are, that is, there is something to it because I'm whole, I'm trying to give, I'm trying to force an idea as opposed to just like enliven and empower the, the moment as it comes up. So I've kind of been working on that. It's very healthy. Yeah, but frustrating because you're probably like, oh man, I had the best thing to say. Like I have 10 so much, ago. so many fucking good things to say when I'm on that show. I have so many ideas that I want to like just grab the wheel and turn. Tim's like, I am the, let me conduct this thing for a minute, <laughs> dude. Like, yes, I know. That's where we're at. What now. are like yeah. the, is that the biggest challenge of, um, of being on the show is like the, like ugh, the holding back? Um, yeah, uh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So a, a lot of times, because so many brilliant people come in and talk about amazing things that I want to just like mind meld. But it's like um, it used to be when me and Tim were early doing it in the early days, it was kind of like I was thinking of it as like we're in a band and we're, we're jamming. Hmm. And then it got to the point where it, I was making too much. I, and he was like, it, let me con I'm the conductor and you're like first, you know, trumpet. So I, that's a, for me, it's a much better metaphor I'm, I'm, I'm trying to create like an orchestrative flow. I, I don't want to like stand out. I don't want every, I don't mm. want anyone to look at the first drum and be like, why is he making so much noise? Why is he? And every once in a while, there's a, there's a time and a place for a solo, but let the conductor conduct and, and it's, it flows, seems to flow seamlessly. Or uh, be the rusty trombone. I'm into it. <laughs> Let's get rusty oxidation all the way. <laughs> yes. Let me force a rusty trombone joke here. Okay. What? Yeah. So is that the, um, I'm talking about, that's interesting. The other differences between like when you first started and now feeling like, cause I remember when I would work at the, uh, I worked at, in admissions, like I worked at this all boys prep school on the Upper East Side and they would, and it's interesting. I'm like, oh, we're looking at kindergartners. Like it's kindergarten admissions. Like how difficult could it be? But I would talk to the, the lady who was like evaluating and she'd be like, no, you can't. It's like building an orchestra. Building a class is like building an orchestra. It's like, you can't have all trumpet players. You can't have all like saxophone players. 
and not not like we're going to consider one instrument to be alpha and a different instrument is like beta or whatever. And I feel like those words are so overused, but like, mm -hmm. yeah, you have to look for that balance. Like the kid that's super outspoken, like peacocky, like hello. And he's very good at communicating. He asks for what he wants. It's like, okay, but the kid who's quieter, who's more sensitive, who shares like, okay, th that's just as important. And mm -hmm. these kids learn from each other. And I think that's a, uh, then you get the Omega kid. <laughs> psychic and the Zeta is the Zeta bro. Yeah. Is that one? Is that one too? The Theta, the Theta yeah. girl. Oh I yeah. Love that shit. Uh, I, ooh, uh, that's a super chat from Matthew. How do you balance making people look good and being assertive and prevent disappearing in the background and being forgettable? It's an incredible question. That is We're like the art. Just of, talking about that. Yeah. yeah. If there is an art form in entertainment, that's it, in my opinion, is at least in scene work, when you're working in a collaborative state, how how do you, you know, a lot of it is trust because if you make people look good and and they want to work with you again in the future, a lot of times, um, you, they just like your energy and, and then they'll have you back. And then, so you never really disappear. From my experience, I never really disappeared. People would like remember me uh, because of how good I made them feel while they were in like a vulnerable state and how I supported them unexpectedly when they're, you know, doing something new, uh, unknown. And, and I'm, there, you know, I love that feeling when you're like taking a risk and someone backs you up that you didn't know how or why it was possible. And you're like, Dad, fuck, man, this is why I have what friends are for in a lot of ways. And also, I think it's. Oh, sorry. Oh, that was it. I was just going to say that that's, I think, what where the trust comes in that you kind of give and, and expect nothing in return. Now that I'm noticing, like, there's the four of you, right? Like you and Le Lydia, you're also there in case, and who knows, maybe this has happened on the show, in case not like a fight, but if there's a serious disagreement or things get really tense, it's not just two people. I'm on one, someone's on one side and someone's on the other side. It's like, okay, you and Lydia are there to be like, mediate if there's an awkward moment you can step in like if, if no one i've never seen this happen but if no one really has anything to say like you're there lydia's there to like pick it up um ha have you ever felt like that's been something that that happened like there was a tense moment and and you guys were there to kind of like talk about dmt yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah let's talk about drugs 100 percent. yeah i uh fortunately tim's so good at communicating that it very rarely ever breaks down i mean the show's like a bunch of master commute or like expert communicators. Like if Tim stops and gets up to go get a drink or something, I'll just start talking. I've been doing this for uh, over a decade. So I, I, it's pretty seamless when you just start flowing with your ideas. And then every once in a while, Tim, like uh, we did an after show with Dave Smith, you know, Dave, I love Dave. Yeah. Amazing dude. And I want to talk to him about the federal reserve. So Tim was like, I'm going to go watch uh, TV. He just didn't, he was tired. It was like a Friday. Wow. He to do so he just, me and Dave, I just interviewed Dave and it was great. Um, I think the balance, the anchor, because, you know, as a host, you can fly and you can go pretty fast. But if you don't have an anchor, you know, you can get lost. So I'm kind of like a return to center anchor. Like if things get too wacky, I'll talk about the Federal Reserve or graphene or free software or DMT. Yeah, some What's you know, the important stuff. Graphene is um, it's a it's carbon. It, it's pure carbon. It's just uh, hexagonally lat latticed carbon. So it looks like a, f and it's one layer of atoms. So it's one layer thick of atoms. Is the insert you put in a mechanical pencil? That's graphite. <laughs> graphite. Okay. And the way they found graphene was by uh, the, some researchers in like 2001 at Scotch tape had, had attached some graphite and they peeled it off. And then they looked at it under a microscope and it had formed into graphene, a layer of graphene. Wow. And it's it's got incredible properties. It's it's like electrically conductive. It is a capacitor, so it can store energy. It's um, flexible. It's it's deformable like paper. It's in the right format. It's stronger than steel. Like you can alloy it with things. Uh, also, to have other properties, um, they were alloying it with aerogel, this really lightweight material, to make water filtration out of it. Cool. It's it, it will be the future of construction. 21st century steel and wood will will probably not be used as much in the future. And I think the the because I mean you can have like touch screen wallpaper with it. You can have clothing made out of it that's like touch screen computer capacity. Like just like, change your outfit, like boom. Yeah, change the color, change everything like a like a screen and um solar powered, you know, it can store body heat. It's 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 amazing. So they're figuring out how to pr produce it right now in a cheap 
effective mass way. What can you do with it right now? Or is it not there yet? You can use water filtration. That's a, a water okay, desalination yeah. they're experimenting with. Uh, apparently it's, it's great at that. Um, and what else is graphene used for right now? I think it, they use it in clothing a lot right now, but it's not, they haven't figured out how to make like capacitive battery storage out of it in your clothing yet that I know of. Wow. It's, it's like when uh, when Black Panther gets hit and he like stores up all the energy and then he like, Wah-pa! like yeah. hits somebody back with it. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm deeply into piezoelectricity. I'm, I'm excited about that. That's like friction, Ooh, motion okay. causing heat, which is stored as electricity. That sounds sexual to me, but maybe yeah, I'm just taking it there. It's it's both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> who have you found have been like your favorite guests, your favorite type of guests? Like, who do you get very excited to see on the show? I like funny, chill people. Um, I like I like everybody, man. You got like James Lindsay, who's like the most brilliant scientific uh, mind. You got Mike so Mouse, who's like smart. a clown, but also a genius. Like Alex Jones, like, uh, you know, a, a super force, like a, I don't know. Just a madman, but like so smart. You know, I, Jack, Jack Murphy. I like yes. Jack a lot. Yeah, I, I just Jack. like him because I know him so well. And it's like, oh, tomorrow Jack's going to be on the show. Thank God. It's so chill. Like, like a friend. Yeah. Yeah. We laugh and smack each other on the back. And like, he's just so healthy and like happy. And, and he's so great to be here. I love Jack. So Jack, if I have to answer, it's going to be Jack. Oh, okay. What up, Jack? Jack is great. I've had him Jack on this show Jack. too. He's he great. feels he feels like the older brother or like dad or like that I never had or something. Yeah. He's just like he fills in a lot of gaps for me. Like he's he a strong male presence. He reminds me of a great friend from college too. This guy, Mike Love, who I hope Mike, I hope you're listening. Uh, he's a DJ. Jack was also a DJ. Oh Those yeah. We get eyes. a lot of DJs listening to this show. Nice. <laughs> Shout out to all the DJs. Make some music. You've been called a hippie. I have seen you. Ma uh, you've posted pictures about making fruit leather and kombucha. Oh my gosh! What'd you think? I was impressed. I uh, I tried to make kombucha once, like years and years ago. My scoby got all jacked up, and I just was like, "This is too much." I like, I don't know. Did you get anything you know, out of it? Uh, no. And I think also I want to make it again, but I go, "Oh, like the people around me like are not going to be into this." Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Like I subtle. sometimes, if I'm into something that's like kooky and overly healthy that I know like my boyfriend's not going to be into, I'm just going to be like, eh. I, yeah. I think I base a lot of like, do other people like this on whether or not I do something. Maybe, maybe do it as like a, as like a, a study on like how to make kombucha. Then they won't think you're weird. Yeah. I could make, I'll just be like, it's for content. Yeah. Yeah. And the fruit leather too. Oh, it's Matthew again. Will Ian go into an isolation tank and take DMT? Yes. Yes, I will. <laughs> you sponsoring this, Matthew? Thank you, Matthew. That's a great question, and the answer is yes. Um, we <laughs> I looked at building me. a I looked at building a, a sensory deprivation tank here in the house, but you need like a, a specific room for it because the it, it's salt water and it corrodes the uh, the air and the environment. So really? you kind of, yeah, you need like um like tile like a pretty and it needs ventilation. So we haven't built one yet. Uh, built a room for it yet. But Tim also is into it, so I think we're going to prioritize one of those in the coming coming month, maybe maybe a year or something. It's really about that if we can get space good. for it. Yeah, dude. Have you ever done one before? No. Most of my sensory deprivation has just yeah been just through alcohol. Oh yeah, that'll do it too. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, if you go into these tanks, Joe talk Rogan talks about a lot where like he t takes like mushrooms or something and then like goes just into the depth of darkness and like his own mind and allows the thoughts cool. to yeah. The, the silence, the stability, the waves. I mean, the, the, it's incredible. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Oh, we have another question that I missed. Who was the worst guest on TimCast? Was anyone unnecessarily rude or difficult? Yeah, Chrissy. She was a bitch. Hey! No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, uh, no, no. The, people are so happy to be there. It, 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 people are very, very gracious. Every guest has been so awesome. It's so awesome. And the the, the great thing is, I get to know them over time too. So like some, the first time people come in, they kind of look at me and they're like, Hey, but they're there to see Tim. They don't know. So then the second time they come back, they are so excited to see me. And it's like, we become like uh Posobic when he, when I first met Jack Posobic, I didn't, we barely talked. I don't even think I was on the show that day. Um, it was just him and Tim, but then like he came back and it was like, we were great friends. It was awesome. Wow. Yeah. 
I love that guy. Also is the best. I thought he was like a like stodgy in the beginning because he wore a suit. I just assumed he's like, oh, he's like very serious and writes books. Yes, that I, I got that impression of him too. I only I met him once, like briefly at I think it was like a walk away um rally in DC like months ago. Uh, and he just seemed very almost like he could have been a member of Secret Service, like just yeah. in a suit and just glasses and just like all he's business. So funny. Vibe. Yeah. You're such a hilarious guy. He's a cool dude. I think I I think I got all the other chats and stuff. Who would you like to see on or what kinds of guests would you like to see on that you haven't yet? Um, I want to talk to Jordan Peterson a little bit and oh, like yeah. Brett Weinstein, um, Brett and Eric both. Like I'd love to get Lex Freeman and Elon Musk on and Joe Rogan. Um, oh yeah. Duncan yeah, Trussell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love Duncan. Um, and uh, oh, gosh, that that's like my top off the top of my head list. Really? I mean, I've been watching Rogan's stuff since like 2013 or something. And and his guests are like top Rhonda Patrick would be amazing. Um, God, Audrey, uh, Aubrey, uh, Marcus, who is a good friend of Joe's who does, he runs on it. He's awesome. He's like, Oh, a okay. The psychonaut, he like goes into the jungle and takes ayahuasca and has all these like breakthrough experiences. Oh man. I would love to do that kind of stuff. I just feel like I have so much work. Like I'd need to like really have to do a lot to like set up to be away away for that long. Mm -hmm. Like two weeks or something. Yeah. I just can't remember the last time I was, doing vacation or something for two weeks yeah same that'd be great I'm a workaholic man you're great um, at it what are some do you feel like there are certain like taboo set well of course for youtube you can't discuss certain taboo subjects but do you feel like uh, other than the guests you named do you would you what are the topics that you wish you wanted like you could go deep on 9-11 that's mm -hmm. a big one. I, I I was there at Ground Zero. I worked at nine at Ground Zero. Really? Yeah. I I moved to Whoa. New York September fifth and <laughs> September. Oh, yeah. I was like, I'm gonna start temping and do theater. It's it, oh that's god, that's a no brainer. Yeah. And, and then the buildings came down, and I and I, I was I was very I was devastated. I ended up temping down there, and um, you know, as years went on, and I learned about like. 9-11 architects and engineers for truth for 9-11 and on the physics involved and everything. I just, I feel like that's a subject that I, I, I wish was more, more openly talked about because war is the most devastating, horrible thing to inflict on a populace. And if it's done by mistake, I call it off, call off the race. It's over. Stop. Mm -hmm. Everyone get, take care of the people first. That's a big one. That makes a ton of sense. Right. Well, it's like, well, uh, they know and it's like they probably got a lot to gain that's what the last year and a half has taught me like yeah look look at who is to benefit who is to make money from everything that happens yeah yeah, yeah. if you can because a lot of times they hide behind curtains and stuff they don't want to be they don't want to be seen they want their organization like black what was it black uh black black rock that that like oh yeah mercenary firm changed mm -hmm. its name monsanto got bought by bear changed its name mm. bad press you know they don't want to they don't want the press. They want to hide in the in the darkness where they can't be spotted. Yeah. Like cockroaches. Yes. Like little <laughs> bugs. Much love to those people. I want them to do well too. Just, just you know, together with everyone else. That's the only way. Yeah. In my opinion. Do you uh do you find yourself like would you describe yourself more like libertarian, more like maybe anarchist? Uh, I, I think I'm more libertarian than anything. I don't know how, I don't know how it's really defined. So I don't really define myself going into situations, but I, I, I think that technology and like individual sovereignty is key. It, it, it kind of reigns supreme. I don't like centralized authority very much because I've seen it go corrupt too many times. So, and that, but that permeates to like technology, to government, to, uh, banking, like central banking drives me nuts. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely more libertarian. Yeah, I, I, I don't think you need you. political parties, though. Oh yeah, uh, aren't, they're so they're all so similar in so many ways. Wait, so what did you do after nine eleven? You just like Dude. brushed the ash off, went back. Where were you living at the time? I was in Astoria in Queens. Oh wow, okay, um, yeah, I lived there. Yeah, my buddy called me and was like, "Dude, we just got attacked by terrorists." I was like, "Oh god!" So a couple. Uh, Are we still weeks. getting brunch or what? Yeah, I was like, <laughs> so I've seen in a minute. Man, that was a weird day. Everyone got together. One of our friends worked on the like one of the top floors. No one had heard from him. So we all just thought he died. But it turned out he was been on vacation. We found out later. Dude, what? that was freaky. Wow. Um, 
I, a, a few weeks had gone by from September 11th and I had, couldn't get work. I, I, I was, I was going to start temping for 18 bucks an hour, but by the time that happened, all the industry like crushed to a halt and I, I couldn't, couldn't afford my, my bills or anything. I was weird. I was living in my buddy's closet. I just moved out out of college. Was it a walk-in closet at least? Yeah, technically, but the bed <laughs> took up the whole thing. Uh. And I ended up getting a job temping down at ground zero um, for like 11 bucks an hour, but it was something. And, and I worked there from like, uh, October to December. And then I left to go back to my parents' house for Christmas. And when I came back, the job had been filled and I, I, I was gone, but it was, was the uh, temping job, like ground zero, like you're helping like s sweep up ash and stuff. No. Okay. It, uh, <laughs> when I first got down there, it was like, lawless anyone could walk up on the pile they called the, the, the collapse oh the pile my. but they were like it's dangerous so be careful it's loose you might fall you might get hurt don't don't do it so i never went up on it um and then as the the weeks went by they started getting like colored passes for people and like you needed a red pass to go up on the pile the green pass wow. could only get you in and then they'd have all those military checkpoints and i sat in the american express building across the street that had been like blown open like the windows had just been blown through by the explosions um, wow. and, and shat just the ground floor had just been, sh the wall the shattered. It was like open to the, it was freezing. And I sat in there with a cop and just like did security for AMEC, the construction company, one of the three oh, construction wow. companies that got contracted to do the cleanup. Wow. That's so interesting. I read Were Harry you... Potter books. <laughs> I read Dune at that point at that time in my life. My dad was like a teamster at the time. So he was like down there a lot, like with oh. cleanup and stuff. Were you in the city? No, I was in college. I was in Fairfield, Connecticut. So I just was like kind of watching it. It seemed so far away, even though geographically it was not. And I'm from Long Island. So it's like was the middle point. But uh, yeah, I didn't know anybody who died. I think for a minute we're like, oh, was my brother working that day? Oh, no, he was in the White Plains office. OK. And then I think he was working for God, maybe Con Edison at the time or something. Uh, my dad, he didn't have any like cool cleanup stories. And then he just like, you know, has this like cough or whatever and he's like oh, yeah. yeah whatever it's from 9 11 no but he's like he's just like unbearably tough so yeah in the beginning like, anyone was just breathing everything and then it wasn't only until like a month later like november that they osha i think came in and was like hey we needed to get everyone to do a breathalyzer and make sure that you weren't sick before we give you this badge that says that you're healthy so they would measure mm -hmm. everyone's you'd breathe in you'd blow in as hard as you can and they'd be like okay you're good here's your tag Apparently, oh, I still have the mask. It's in my parents' attic with the same filters for that air. So if you put the mask on and breathe it in, you can smell what it smelled like <gasps> at ground zero. That's neat. Yeah. Unless I'm bringing it out here the next bodies. time. Yeah, bring it out. I don't know if it's asbestos or what. And if you breathe in hard, man, it, it messes up your lungs. Whoa, that's really cool. Like it's yeah, perfect. Nice. You should have a little Ian museum. Okay. Um, <laughs> Jimmy asks... Ian, you crack into your copy of The Divided Brain and the making of the Western world yet? The hemisphere differences explain so much. P.S. Ask, ask Jack Murphy about Jordan Hall and Daniel Schmachtenberger. It's quite a name. Uh, wow. Okay, I'll I'll, ooh, I'll try to remember that to ask Jack about that. Maybe tweet that at me too. With, tag Jack in it and that'll help. Um, tweet it. The Divided Brain and the making of the Western world. Is that a book? I, I have not. I have not he, read that. this. This super chat sounds like Jimmy sent you these books and he's wondering if you're reading them. Yeah, I don't think I got <laughs> it, Jimmy. Sounds. If you send it to the P.O. <laughs> box, sometimes I was just thinking this morning how things get lost in this gigantic behemoth of a house that Tim bought. Um, and so if you send me that book, man, I haven't seen it uh, yet. Hopefully I will. The divided brain in the making of the uh, sort of the, the divided hmm. brain. All right. The hemisphere differences, like the brain hemispheres. I think so. That's cool. Yeah, it is cool. I was listening to a podcast about the brain hemispheres the other day. I was like, yeah, I don't think about this stuff as much as I should. How do you identify like left brain or right brain? Oh, God. Um, I think the reason why I can be so uh, unproductive, like I know I could be more productive, but I think because I'm not as a isn't the right side the more creative side or the one side is the more yeah. like logically minded doing yeah. tasks like it's almost things are simpler mm -hmm. and Left. i think if i were more if i were more that way i would get so much more done with my day and i think it explains like my add tendencies and like 
just daydreaming and it's like i'll just be in my emotions but i'll be like oh my tasks the things i have to do oh but this i gotta call this person and then i'll just get a hear a song and i'll get a feeling and then i'll just be like oh i'm like crying about my dead mom yeah the um the left brain i grew up very left brain and it was almost like a prison of 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 like sheltered emotion i couldn't feel i never cried i didn't cry for like 15 years or something growing up there was like from age like 13 to 23 five or six i didn't cry or something wow. crazy and and i didn't really i mean i love i loved but i didn't really i don't know man i just it I, I would try and like like um what do you call it like justify feelings like okay. logically and then i don't know if it was psychedelics or what i think it was psychedelics like they say lsd when they do fmri scans which is the uh well mri is magnetic resonance imaging fmri is like a uh ferromagnetic maybe i don't know but it's fluid it's like a it's like a movie of the of the scan Ooh. so they want they look at the brain light up in people with lsd in studies and they it lights up like both hemispheres at once like a baby like a child's brain That's and cool. it was right around that time in my life that i started crying more and and feeling and like and and just you know like like feeling so yeah you access more more parts yeah yeah i think i'm more accessed on on both sides but i'm definitely more of a left brainer by nature maybe because i'm yeah. a male maybe it's a more of a male male female thing oh, yeah. i'm not sure exactly all that male logic flowing that, in testosterone <laughs> yeah uh matthew again what do you think about defunding the fbi move their responsibilities to the secret service u.s marshals and border control border patrol ice well uh i do think that we could benefit from less government agencies like i was around before homeland security was a thing oh, and everything was yeah. fine you know and then they the built year 2000 this, yeah all this crazy new like money spending to make more law and more things i don't know if we need to defund the fbi it seems at, at face value it seems heavy-handed like a heavy-handed uh response to a problem so there might be there might be some value to it i would love to consolidate uh some of these government government like law uh, uh law what would you call them? law enforcement agencies mm -hmm. yeah the three letters yeah yeah i i feel that too snake skinner randall carson mm. would be an amazing guest thank you are you familiar with randall's work i'm not he's a geologist and like uh climatologist i think is the one way to look at it. he studies like asteroid impacts and things and he and graham cool. hancock graham have you heard of graham hancock no he's, he's a um an archaeologist <laughs> And he's a writer and he's like postulated their ancient history and ancient cultures that had technology that Ooh, we don't, that were yeah, lost. Yeah, like with Tartaria. I've been looking at the Tartarian yes. mud flood Instagram. Uh, you got to get uh, Andreas Nicholas on the show. He actually lives here in the house. He's an <gasps> expert on Tartaria. He's what? That's so cool. Oh, okay. I don't know. Did You might not have said, he might have, I don't know if he was here when you were here, but yeah. I think he's I did meet him. Yeah. At Exertus, X I R T U S. Okay. Cool. Um, so Randall was doing all these postulations about like Atlantis and like this history of this ancient flood myth and like the Bible, there's a great flood. And Randall came in with all this data and was like, yeah, it looks like there was a cometary impact 12,800 years ago at the end of the Younger Dryas period where a comet shattered over North America and peppered the North American glacial plate and melted all the ice in North America at once and caused Whoa. a cataclysmic flood that wiped out all the megafauna in North America, all these giraffes and zebras and elephants. They were just tarred, ground to dust by these like hundred or thousand foot torrents of current of water and mud That's just so neat. flattening the, now what we know is the great plains, which were just flattened and all that water went out into the Atlantic and then smeared up onto West Africa. And you can see like, if you look on Google maps on the satellite, you see the smear of sand up onto Africa. And that's where apparently Atlantis was in the eye, the Rakat oh. structure, the eye of Mauritania. It was just covered in mud. And as the story went, Atlantis was covered in mud after a great earthquake, I think, or something. Uh, Randall's the data guy. Randall Carlson is amazing. And yes, thank you for reminding me. Randall and Graham, I would love to have on the show. Ooh. Okay, here's another one. Ian, a good guest for 9-11 would be Ryan Dawson. He runs ANC Report and is knowledgeable on geopolitics, especially in the Middle East. I'm looking him up. Thank you very much. Ooh. Ryan Thanks, Johnny boy. Okay. Look at that. All right, I've got it queued up to look at after the show. I'm excited. Thank you. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm sure you guys get flooded with 
requests for people. I, I, I like, I'm getting a lot of requests too, which I take as compliments. It's like, Oh, people are listening and caring. That's, mm -hmm. that's cool. They want to see like how you, it's like chemistry. Like what happens if I put this vinegar in this water and this oil, yeah. and like you're the vinegar and I'm the oil or whatever. I want to be the oil. All right. Okay, you're the <laughs> Here's oil. DJ Cogdale. Ian, if you can absolutely, if you can absolutely need to get Scott Horton back, he's one of the best foreign policy experts there is. Ryan Dawson is fantastic too. We'll oh. have a rope for Ryan Dawson. All right, Ryan Dawson. I love Scott Horton, man. He is so cool and so fun to hang out with. I love his coffee. Horton's coffee. No. Is that his? Is that some... <laughs> Probably not. <I> no. <laughs> it's a Canadian brand. Oh. Okay, cool. Wow, this was great. Oh, yeah, I wanted to ask you about the house. So you live in Tim Pool's house. I do. I, have I didn't know how much of that you guys could talk about, but it's like it's a couple of you, right? Yeah, there's four of us. Uh, it's it's pretty awesome. It's it it's like our headquarters. Awesome. It's the Timcast headquarters, and it's it's in the woods. It's beautiful. The air is so clean. It's f it's fun to be around friends. I I I've been my sleep schedule is jacked. Like I'll drink coffee on the show sometimes, and then I'll be up till like seven a.m. and then I'll sleep oh, till wow. like six forty five p.m. And then get up and do the show and then go back to stay up till 7 a.m. But I, this morning I got up early and I was walking around and I was like this. It was like Dane was there and and um, Wendy was there and like all these awesome and people that work with Tim Cast and talking to Tim. We went out and tasted tomatoes off the vine. And I was like, oh, wow, this is it's like you remember Maker Studios from no. uh, Disney Bottom. It was this company. It was this group of YouTubers in like 2007, 2008. And we all got to all these YouTubers came together to form this thing called the station. We, me and Danny, uh, the guy who created it, were like, how do we make like a better union? I wanted to help make like a, a, a web actors guild. So we were talking about like bring all the actors together. We have a, a giant mega thing. It was kind of like the first multi-channel network, MCN. And um, it feels like that. It feels like there's this resurgence of like entertainment. And um, it's very cool to be a part of it and it to live cool. there. Almost like kids. Not that you're kids. I mean, you're grown ass men and women, but like it feels like, oh, the kids are running the house, you know, because there's beanbag chairs. You guys have like a, a big like viewing room, right? There's a sauna, there's a freaking skate room. So I came, I came down earlier and Tim was outside with the chickens. I was like, Farmer Tim. And he was out there like laughing. Is he wearing a big and, like, hat? Is he wearing overalls and nothing else? That's no, what I picture. On, he puts on big boots. Yeah, he doesn't. I didn't see the overall. That's Aww. a great idea. Um, and he was like looking for eggs to see if they had any butt pastries. Sticking his hand up chicken's yeah. butts. I imagine give me that's one, how you give look. Me one. Yeah, <laughs> squeeze well, it out. That's normal though. Right? That's right. That's normal. Yeah. Oh sure. But yeah. Putting it. That's, that's what you're fun. supposed to be at, right? <laughs> yeah. They come out warm apparently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, apparently, if you soak fresh eggs in lime juice and water, it call it does what's called glassing the egg, and it preserves it for a long period of time after that. Whoa. Yeah. I know what I'm going to do this weekend. Glass some. Oh, Matt, again, can Ian talk about city air pollution and brake dust? Thank you for bringing that up. And this is something I think I heard about on one of Joe Rogan's podcasts is the brake dust. I didn't realize in the early, I thought that I lived in like New York City for years and then Chicago and then Los Angeles. And I thought it was all like carbon monoxide from the, the tailpipes, but it turns out it's the brake dust. So I when the car brakes had dust and the nuts, the brake pads, when they hit the brakes, it, you know, causes pressure on the brake pads, which then kicks this like dust into the air that the it has such fine particulates that it gets through the alveoli and the lungs right into the bloodstream. And it is like Whoa. poison. So all this like mental discontinuity or whatever the hell yeah. you want to call it is like, seems to be a result more of the brake dust than of the actual gas in the air. So people who sit in more traffic, Breathe yeah. in more brake dust. Terrifying. I'm looking. I mean, the nice thing about Teslas are they have a magnetic braking, so there's no brake pads. So that's Ooh. very. I'm really excited about electric vehicles and how those will help revolutionize the the purity of these cities. Aren't they still expensive right now? Yeah, I think they are. What thirty grand for a cheap or thirty five grand for the Ooh. cheapest one, maybe up to like two hundred fifty, eighty grand for the second level one. We'll have to ask AOC. Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, no void. Ian says some crazy things, but sometimes I appreciate his input and opinion on the show. Keep it up, Ian and Graphene. No void. <laughs> you're like, speaking my love language. Sounds like a sounds like your French girlfriend, Ra Graphene. I would date her. She sounds hot. <laughs> she sounds very intelligent. Yeah, I like getting the crazy stuff out of the way. 
Like that's kind of my my new game plan is I just act as cra- all my crazy on the table day one so that I don't mm-hmm. have to be afraid of it. Yeah, that every day after that it seems, oh, he's tame today. Like, oh, yeah. he's having a chill day. Like I set the bar at D plus so that if I get a C, everyone's super happy. That's great. That's I learned that in school. I used to, were you like a try hard in school? Um, no, not really. I like, I would kind of focus on charming the teachers a little bit. Like I would win them over with my personality and then maybe they'd throw a plus under that B. Mm-hmm. Um, but I genuinely liked art uh, and like environmental science, but that was it. In the early days, I would get like A's all on everything. I'd get A in like in elementary school. And then all of a sudden I got a B and everyone was like, what happened? And I was like, what do you mean? What happened? I don't know. I did my best and I got a B. Who cares? And they're like, it's not. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit. I have an expectation set now because I got A's all the time. So I'm going to not, I'm going to get C's. And then wow. when I get B's, they'll all be, they'll all be super happy. My parents didn't buy it. They grounded me for C's and D's <laughs> for years. But and then you were most, like, fuck you, I'm majoring in theater. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let me go. Take the chain off my neck, dude. Um, but you know, that fucking school grades is so ridiculous anyway. But I realized yeah. don't try hard all the time. Cause then if you, if you relax, maybe, you know, you'll let people down. So I try and kind of have fun with life. And then when it's time to focus, I give it my all. Exactly. Like don't always shave your legs because Mm -hmm. don't like always look your best. Yeah. Like every (laughs) three days or or seven days. Yeah. So that's how I do it anyway. Always shower. Mm -hmm. Make it a special occasion. Stinky. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, Ian, you're fun. Um, Thank you for coming on the show. Uh, Where can people find you and follow you and all that good stuff? You can find me really on all social media at Ian Crossland for the most part. Um, Mines, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and uh, iancrossland.net. And of course, Timcast uh, IRL, which tonight the show will be at eight, eight, every, it's Monday through Friday, eight o'clock PM. And I'm usually on. Uh, now that Luke's here, we're, we're reformatting the studio. It's actually, this, we're moving the studio into this room in the coming weeks. And it's going to be a bigger setup. So we're going to have more than just four people. So are you in point, like the viewing room? Where are you? I'm in this interesting room that the previous owners called the sewing room. And it was like a big room that the kids, it was like the kids playroom. Uh, was it a I, sweatshop? Be honest. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. Get off my back. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think it was. It was <laughs> yeah. It was a sweatshop. I'm okay with it. If you are, it's, it's nice. It's really nice. Um, it's gonna, it'll be a better room actually. I think than the other one, it'll be cool. Cool. Sounds good. Ian, so you're the best. Oh, you too, Chrissy. Thanks for having me. Oh, anytime. Oh, wait, did you finish your plugs? Did I cut you off? Yeah, I think I did. Okay. Okay, cool. This was great. Ian, you're a doll. Thanks. We'll Christy. do this again soon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. <laughs>